gathered in this place. Singing beautiful songs of praise to God and study His Word. We will be branching off of Romans chapter 8, 28, and going into some other areas, but I want us to concentrate just on what these verses say, or this verse says here. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. But we understand that the miraculous events of the Old Testament, the miraculous events of the first century are over with. We don't have the miracles like we did. The New Testament tells us that those miracles were coming to an end. And they did. When the final word of God was put down, when that which is perfect came into this world, we no longer needed the miracles. We have God's word. We can confirm that we are a part of God's family by the study of his word and by the preaching of that word. But I'm going to, we're going to look at three different examples today that, that specify that you may be here for a reason. And none of these, even though there are two are in the Old Testament and one is in the first century, none of those were miraculous. They're all by the providential care of God. God's providential care continues on today. Providential care is the benevolent guidance of God. And it's how it is defined. And we have to understand, lots of times we think about, well, the Old Testament, the first century, there were the miracles, and then after the miracles ended, then there became providential care. And that's not correct. Providential care has always been here. It has always helped God's people. Now, whether there were times where the miracles kicked in, but God has always been guiding his people benevolently. And when we look at this, we understand some things. All things are working for the good of God's people. Now that doesn't mean that evil things of this world work for God's good or for the good of his people. But when things are done in accordance with God's will, when we pray, we pray in God's will that it be done, then those things will be done. We may not get always the answer that we want, but we're going to get an answer from God. But He knows best. That's why providence is the benevolent, benevolent guidance of God. It is not just simple guidance, but it is that which will guide us in a way that will help us become stronger, become better, become closer to God. And sometimes when we pray for something, it may not be that it will draw us closer to God. It may actually push us away from God. So we may not always get everything we pray for. But we will get God's guidance and His love and His care. And that's what we need in this world. But God's providential care works for the good of His people. Whatever the things we have to go through, whatever we have to endure, the suffering that we may have to, to withstand, will come out as good as long as we are following God. We have to understand that sometimes we have to go through the things that, that are not nice. Sometimes we don't have, we have to endure things that we may not want to endure. And we, we see this within the world around us. Someone who, who gets a terminal illness may have to endure certain treatments and medications that may make them sick, that may actually make them feel worse than the disease itself. And it is that cure that will actually take the disease away. They may have to endure some suffering to get to a benefit at the end. And that we understand that. I remember when my father contracted cancer, he went through a treatment that when he was on that 18-day treatment, he felt horrible.
one of the patriarchs. In, Gen in Genesis chapter 50, we come to the end of this book. We come to the end of the story of Joseph, basically. We understand about Joseph. His brothers were jealous of him. They sold him into slavery. He ended up in Egypt. He became the second in command of Pharaoh's um, nation there. When the famine hit Israel, his family came to Egypt to get food. And he recognized his brothers. And when they finally recognized who he was, when he had introduced himself to them, they were scared because they thought that he was going to be mad. But we can see it in the picture here that you see on the screen. A scene, a scene of Joseph meeting his brothers and not taking anything out on them. When we look at Genesis chapter 50, starting in verse 15, and I'm going to read down a ways here. It says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us, and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did not, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when he spake to them. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you met evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph, even though he had every right, as far as the world goes, Every right to be upset, every right to take out his vengeance on them, but he understood one thing, that he served God, and God put him in this place. He put him in Egypt to be able to keep that family alive. Through that family would come the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would bring salvation to this world. So it is through Joseph being put through all that he went through, through slavery and through, through prison and through all that he endured to come out on top and actually be second in command of Egypt. To be able to keep his family fed and, and the people in Israel fed so that the lineage of God's Son would continue. He could have asked himself, am I here for a reason? And I think he would answer yes. Because he said it right there very plainly. God meant it for good. He said, you know what, you did sell me, you did abuse me, you did beat me up, but you know what, God was doing the whole time. And he took care of me. He brought me to this place. I want to ask you a question this morning. Joseph was willing to allow God to use him for his purposes. Are you willing to allow God to use you for his purposes? Do you know that you may be here right now for a reason? You know, when I was, I was thinking about this lesson, I thought about all the different things that I had found myself in, all the different places, all the different places I had lived, all the different situations that I had found myself in. And I started thinking back, and I started trying to figure out all the good that I may have done in those places. And it's amazing how my life connected with other people. I'm not bragging about myself. It wasn't me doing it all. It was God working through me. But I was in a place where I could help somebody. You may be here in Arkansas, Arkansas right now because somebody needs you. Can you honestly say you allow God to, to use you? Can you allow yourself to go through suffering so God can use you because you're here in this place? Joseph was. He was willing to do that. Can God count on you no matter how difficult it might get? Can God count on you to allow him to use you? Secondly, go to Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. We think about another character here. In the book of Esther, 
we see a situation where a Jewish woman becomes queen. Her name is Hadassah. She's given the Persian name Esther. The king, Xerxes, uh, gets rid of his, his first wife and marries Esther. She became queen of uh, Persia. And then Haman, because Mordecai will not bow to him, and Mordecai is a relative of Esther, because Mordecai would not bow down to Haman when he comes through the town. Haman gets this plan. He's going to destroy all the Jews. So Mordecai sends a message to Esther. He's like, you need to talk to the king about this. He says, do you, do you realize you are a, a Jew yourself? Do you think that being queen is going to save you from the king's decree? And you have to understand something about the Persian decree. When a king of Persia made a decree, there was no changing it. You could not go backwards. You could not say, well, I'm going to erase that. Once it was made, it was made. All you could do was add something to that to help it along or to, to defeat it somewhere down the road. And that's what happened. The king made the decree that all Jews could die. The Persians could kill all the Jews they could find. Of course, we know the later story is that when Esther finally does talk to the king, he makes another decree and allows the Jews to defend themselves. And of course, more, more of the Persians were killed than the Jews were. So the Jews were spared. But look at verse 14 in chapter 4 of Esther. Let's actually back up to verse 13. It says here, And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do you think in your heart, or do you not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than any of the other Jews? For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. She could have asked herself, am I here for a reason? And Mordecai is saying, yes, you probably are. You are in a position right now, even as a Jew, you are queen of Persia, you are in a position where you can go and you can talk to the king and you can prevent your people from being slaughtered. She was very afraid to do that, but she finally says she would do it. So it's, even if it's going to cost me my life, I will go to the king and I will ask him to fix this situation. I will ask him to make another decision. Because again, at that time, if you went into a Persian king without him asking for you to come in, he could have you killed immediately. Just straight out. No questions. Nothing. He had a little, little, uh, well, scepter, yes, thank you. He had a little scepter. If you rose the scepter and you walked in, then you were okay. If you didn't, then you weren't. Luckily for Esther, when she walked in, he rose, raised his scepter, and it was okay. She was not killed. So we have to understand, she took on a great risk in her life of not coming out of that throne room alive. But she did it because she understood what Mordecai was saying, that it was her responsibility, that she was there for a purpose. And possibly her purpose was to save her people from this, this tragic event that was going on. Mordecai came to her in great distress because there was no hope other than what Esther could do. Esther knew the law of the land. She did not work around the law. She worked with the law of the land. She knew exactly what she was able to do. She did not go in asking the Persian king to, to do away with the ordinance he already made. But she asked him to make another. But she knew he couldn't. One thing I want to ask you now. Will you... Go bravely into whatever situation you find yourself in. Knowing that it might be very treacherous. Knowing that there may be problems about. Will you go into a situation that God puts you in, realizing you may be there for that reason? There may be somebody that needs, needs you to be there. You may be the answer to somebody's prayer. You know, we don't think of ourselves that way, do we? We pray. Uh, I'm sure, frequently, 
if not constantly, for things that we need, for our lives, for growth, spiritual growth. But we have to ask ourselves, how do these prayers get answered? They don't get answered miraculously. They are through providential care. Somebody may be right now praying a prayer that you may be the answer to. When you find yourself in a situation, realize you may be there because of that reason. They may need you in that situation. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody had a Bible question you were able to answer that question for them? We need to realize we have great purpose in this life. And there is much that we can do for God. If we would just allow ourselves the opportunity to see those chances, to understand that God may be using us, that we may be the answer to somebody's pleading with Him, for help. You may be the hope that somebody has been looking for in their life. And then lastly, let's turn into the New Testament. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We see the Apostle Paul in a situation where we would think you would be no, no hope. There would be no reason to to want to be in this situation, Paul finds himself in prison. We would say, well, there's, there's no way that you could ever do anything good in prison. But Paul did not take that, that idea. Paul did not look at it that way. In Philippians chapter 1 and verses 12 through 14, read along with me what is said here. Paul writes, and I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to the rest, to all the rest, that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul states here that the gospel had not been stopped by his imprisonment. In fact, it had been advanced by his imprisonment. There were people that were speaking more boldly because he was in prison. There are people who were supporting Paul, and even though he was put in this position because he was a Christian, because he was speaking about Jesus Christ, they did not allow themselves to be stopped. They allowed themselves to speak even more. And that wasn't the only part. Paul, being in prison, was allowed to have people come into his little cell there, if you will. They were able to sit down. They were able to listen to Paul. He was able to preach to them. Even some of the people of the palace were able to come in. And he mentions there the palace guard. Guess who were protecting Paul, or I guess you could say watching over him, while he was preaching the gospel of people? Palace guards. It was customary to have at least two guards with every prisoner who was considered dangerous. And even though Paul had never done anything physically, harmful to anybody. He was considered dangerous because of the things that he was saying. He was spouting off treachery towards Caesar. So there would be at least two guards, one on either side of Paul. And every time he was preaching and teaching the gospel to somebody, these guards were guaranteed. He was allowed to be able to preach to people that he never would have been able to preach to while he was free. But because he was in that prison cell, there were others that were hearing the word of God. Have you ever found yourself in a situation that you really didn't want to be in? But realize that there were people there that you could talk to. People there that you could explain Jesus Christ. Have you ever been in a situation where you had a captive audience where you could actually talk to somebody? And they couldn't get up and leave. They had a job to do, but they had to be there. This is what Paul this is the situation Paul found himself in. He was able to reach some people while in prison that never would have come around him if they had seen him on the street. They would have crossed to the other side. Because again, we have to understand Christianity at that time was considered a, a heinous crime. It was considered a treachery again and, and spouting lies and, and deceit against Caesar. So it was considered something that was very, very painful to be around. They didn't want any, anything to do with it. Because if they, found, if they were found talking to a Christian, they could be chastised by the Roman officials. 
And Rome was not a nice place to be on the other side of. It was a very, very brutal regime. So if any guards or anybody who was any kind of authority were found listening to a Christian, they would have been chastised. And probably thrown in prison themselves. But here, Paul had an opportunity to talk to people he never would have been able to talk to out on the streets. Paul found his opportunity to preach the gospel. Where are your opportunities to preach the gospel? Where can you teach people about Jesus Christ? Whether it's in word or just through our actions, through the way we react to people, through the way that we, we treat people. When you're in a situation like that where people see a difference in you than they do with others, they'll begin to ask, what makes you different? Why are you the way you are? Why do you not spout off? Why do you not use profanity like other people do? Why do you not spread these jokes like other people do? That seems to be the norm today. One of the elders and I were, were talking last night and said, you can't go to a, a movie anymore without having profane language or nudity or, or something that, we, that the world wants, but we as Christians wouldn't stand. You have to get up and walk out. When the world eats it up. When the world sees us living the way we live and treating people the way we treat people, they're going to want to know why. There's your opportunity. There's your chance to be able to teach them about Jesus Christ. There's your captive audience because when you, when you make people think, why, why is Benny Williams different? Why is Cullen different than other people? Why is Corbin different than other people? Why are we not like the world around us? They're going to want to know. There is your audience. What opportunity can you find in this life? What opportunity can you find right here in our family? And I know we have some that are visitors that don't live in this community. But even while you're here, you may have an opportunity to make an impression on somebody who does it. To point them in the direction of the church of Christ. To point them in the direction of finding God and being able to have their sin worship. We are only here on this earth for a short period of time. We don't know when we're going to end our lives. We don't know when this world is going to end. All we have is today. That's why, to me, opportunities are very, very important. That we don't pass them by. That we don't let them go past without grabbing a hold of them. And getting everything out of them that we possibly can. I want to end by reading the verse that Benny read when we started here. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. What good can you work in this world today? What good will be worked in you or for you in this world today? As we conclude this, I want us to think about the idea. You may be here right now in this community for a reason. There are a lot of us here that were not born and raised in our family. Some of them are here going to college. Some are here because of work. Some are here to retire here. Various reasons. Some are just here visiting. But think about it. Think about it. You may be here for a reason. Don't, you don't have to manufacture the opportunities. If you just keep your eyes open and your heart open, the opportunity will present itself. You just have to grab a hold of it. Let God work through you. That you might be like Joseph. You might be like Esther. You may be like Paul. Well, they were there for a reason. And they allowed God to work through them. And they found the good in their situation. What then do you want to